The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Welcome to another Leon Shiny Report. We're talking to you from Tel Aviv, Israel, and we managed to get the great Yossi Pellet, General Yossi Pellet. If you remember our show, and I'm sure you do, we did some great shows with Yossi when he was in Northern Command. He's a very, very popular commentator now on what's going on in Israel. He refused to go into the Likud party and politics in general, and he will give you an honest opinion about what is going on in the country today. So I'll ask him quick questions. The disengagement, is that a correct move, uh, Yossi, in your opinion? I think that the, the, the real question is, it's not if it's a good or a bad uh, move. I think that we find ourselves in an impossible situation. And it's not possible now to stop it. And if you ask my opinion, I, am I in favor or not? The, the answer will be yes, I am in favor. I am in favor. Even I am divided because it's one thing I feel in my heart, and the second thing is not my head that uh, told me to do. And I think we have no choice. We must uh, do it. And the whole question, or let's say the most important question is, what will happen after that? Is that a start of a process? Or it's a process by itself? Last yeah. week we had Abu Bilal on the show. Abu Bilal said that's the real... Uh, uh, important decision that Sharon will have to make, historical decision, whether you truly separate or you build this fence and you separate because of the demographic problem, or you continue to go and, and you know, don't really have a strategic plan. You know what happened to a lot of people in Israel, that part of us start to think that what we dream to have became the reality. And our dream is to live like Switzerland, France, uh, you name the countries, because we start as a nation be a little bit, I don't know if a little bit, but we start to be tired. And when a person, like a nation, you get sloppy. Yeah, so the, your wishes or your illusions start to be for you the reality. And that's what I'm afraid about. By the way, I want to, to note, this is my opinion, and I hope I am wrong. After we finish the steps, uh, according to what we're talking, Gaza, we shall be, we shall be uh, out of Gaza. If somebody thinks that it will bring a peace to Israel, I'm afraid not. And I wish to be wrong. I'm afraid not, because one of, of the mistakes that we do, the Israelis, is that we try to understand the other side, namely the Palestinians, from our mentality, our education, our value of life. It's absolutely different. And what the Palestinians will understand, if they are right or wrong, is that we left because of their terror activities. Even it's not true. But it's not important what we think. It's important what they think. So it's not so simple, and I, as I said just two minutes ago, if it's the beginning of a general process, a whole process that will continue later, we can uh, take it. But if it's only a step by itself, I'm not sure. It's a, Is there right. an answer to the demographic problem? We have no answer. We must uh, separate between ourselves and them. But separate, with the whole meaning of the word separate, they will live there. You want, you want your own country? Live there. Don't come here even to work. That's what I think. Live there, let us to live here. Otherwise, according to your question, in the long run, maybe not in the long run, 10, 20 years for a nation is nothing. For us it's a lot. As person, for, for, for a nation, 20 years is nothing. They may take over this country. So we must separate. And the time is not in favor with Israel. You remember Leon very well. 
67, after the big victory, we made so many mistakes because once you are the winner, you have such a big victory, you have the, the privilege to be large, to suggest, what did our leader at this time, Moshe Dayan, Goldimir, the what did they do? The only guy who had a long-term strategy was Abba Evan, who no one listened to him. He was the one that said it, and if you go to the history books, you'll see that he spoke about, you know, we're victorious, now's the time to give back, not to keep schwitzing and bragging. But that's natural, that's, that's human nature. So it's very hard. But about two weeks ago, Boogie Yalom, who was the former chief of staff, gave a very pessimistic uh, interview about what he thought the future of this country looks like in terms of, uh, he thought it's uh, impossible basically at this stage to have two-state solution. Would you agree with that? I prefer not to speak too much, uh, especially in the media, about Boogie Yellow. Uh, I think it's a mistake for a person like Boogie Yellow, a person that just finishes a duty as the chief of staff to suddenly give such an estimating about the future of, of, of Israel. Oh, he has an opinion, that's it. Yeah, that's his... But you're saying because he came from such a high position, you have to be very careful about your words. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, Leon, I have to be very careful now with my words. I'm afraid, Leon, that if Bugi Yalon got another year as chief of staff, I'm not sure that he will say what he said. Uh -huh. So, I, so I don't look, feel comfortable with no, the, what he to, said. All right, so I understand it's a sort of a personal story of Bogi Yalom. It hit this uh, nation very hard, but the next week, uh, uh, Mr. Dichter, who ran the Shin Bet, came out with a very optimistic uh, view, and he thought that Israel was in the right direction in what they were doing. So there were two opposites <laughs> in two so, weeks. Yeah, I, I, I try to be... Uh, uh, ever, and I strive not to be an average uh, citizen of this country, watching TV, read newspaper, look at the chief of staff that just finished now his duty, look at the Avi Richter, by the way, that I appreciate this guy, he's one of the best guy I know, and I say, just a moment, who is right here? Of course. Who is right here? Right here. And an average person must be very confused to hear, so two different uh, opinions from people that are on the top of the top. I understand. And uh, <laughs> as we know life, I think there's a choice maybe between those two opinions. You are not a member of any party right now? No, because I don't believe uh, right. in the, the difference between the big parties. I'm going to ask you some questions. Yeah. You were offered to come into the could, is that correct? Yeah. And you said you didn't want to go into politics at that stage. You're also a very close friend of Barack. He was yeah. Barack now. Can he lead this country again, in your opinion? You ask me a very sensitive and a, and a very complicated question. You know why? Because he was the prime minister and we, we saw the results. Right. Terrible. I was very frustrated because I, as a person, built on this guy. I said, that's a new generation of, of leadership. That's a man that can bring really a new future to Israel. To but he's life. down in the polls with the Labour Party. Um, you know what? Uh, he made so many mistakes. Maybe because he's too clever, you know. He's too clever and then he starts to believe that he by himself uh, knows everything. He's not a God. And yeah, second to God. And uh, he doesn't have anyone beside him, uh, on left or right. But coming back to your question, you have to ch to uh, check the, the alternatives. Who are the alternatives? Right. I'll ne mention names, Leon. I think that. Are you satisfied with Arik Sharon today? Not at all. I'm not uh, satisfied with him. I'm not satisfied because, or let's say, although I agree with him, as I say, with the, the, the move that he has been doing in the, according to the Gaza Strip. I cannot uh, agree that a leader that go to... Um, once he put his ideology, ideological in front of the, the, the nation, and when you have election, you say, 
You go 180 degrees the other he, way. He so told the nation, he look. Betrayed. The, the settlements in Gaza are like Kibbutz Negba, Ashkelon. Okay. It's okay if you said it. If it's, that's it's really what you think of. And after a few months you say, ah, oh, just a moment. From this chair, namely the chair of the Prime Minister, everything looked different. You know, as a businessman, once you sign the contract, you have to, to, to follow uh, what you sign. Politics. And when you go to election, what you told the, the, the nation is something like a, a, a contract. You won't change your mind, it's okay. Go back to the nation. He didn't agree. And that's a thing that I cannot understand. I cannot agree. And like he did with his, pa his own party. He came to the party and said, okay, let's hear what you, uh, you think about my steps. Whatever will be the result, I respect. And the result fell against him, and you know what, what, what he did. I cannot accept it. All right, I know you're in a hurry. Uh, Don Kalutz is the new chief of staff and came from the Air Force. Uh, you're a former general, and basically you were a tankist and the land force guy. Uh, can uh, this work very well, and, and what do you think about Kalutz? I know Don Kalutz, and I think it was an outstanding decision to put him as uh, the chief of staff. I know the difficulties come from the Air Force and me now the chief of staff. It's all the meaning of being chief of staff. I think it's a good decision. I believe it's a, a chance to change the whole structure of the idea that uh, hasn't been changed for so many years. And according to what I heard from uh, Dan Khalut when I, uh, I met him and he spoke to, to me months ago before he became a chief of staff, I think we have a good chance now to see a difference. So he's a great hope for... Yeah, I hope very much. I believe that he is able to do. And I hope that the fact that he became chief of staff will not change his mind. All right, take advantage of the fact that you're a northern commander. Syria, do you think peace will come in the next few years with them? I don't know what you mean uh, next few years. If you are talking about two, three, four years, who knows? By the way, you know, it's... Uh, this area is an unpredictable area. You, <laughs> what you think today, tomorrow is wrong. To be frank with you, Leon, you know me at this time already when I was a division commander in Sinai and right. you visit there. When I, the, when, I, when I heard on the radio that Sadat is coming uh, to Israel, right. I was damn sure it's, it's, a, it's a trick. It will not happen. And I was sitting in front of the TV. I was a brigadier general this time. I saw him come out of his airplanes. It was a dream. And if somebody in Israel is, uh, told you, me, six months before that, not a, a long time, that that's what's going to happen. You know, when I was the Northern Commander, I took him in 91, before the, the Gulf War, yeah? If somebody, two, three months before the, the war started, would say, look, the Syrian, we took a division from the Golan Heights, moved it to Saudi Arabia to fight with the Americans against the Iraqis. I said, what? <laughs> you are crazy. And it's happened. So in this area, it's very, very difficult to predict what's going to be. I believe it will be that at the end of the day, we shall live in peace. When and what the price we shall pay until it's come, I don't know. We got to study the Bible. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. That's uh, General Yossi Pellin, very outspoken, a great uh, media favorite in this country because he doesn't belong to any party. Both of them were uh, trying to get him to be part of their parties, and uh, he he abstained. And so you get really the truth. We'll be right back with Dr. Nati Laor. Who will give us some uh, psychological, psychiatric, sociological, anthropological answers about what's going on in Israel today with its population. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high to have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Now get the book the hit movie was based on, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. 
Learn about the backdoor channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty. Become a witness to history and order backdoor channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order backdoor channels. Available now over iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play. Leon Charney's cantorial CD in Disco Long. Listen as Charney movingly sings El Mole Rachamim and Charney's amazing rendition of a disco remix of Adon Olam, all sung in the incredible and individual Charney style. Also listen to the CDs on Rhapsody. Download Leon Charney's cantorial songs in Disco Long, the disco remix of Adon Olam on Amazon, iTunes, and Google Play. Or listen in on Rhapsody, all available now. We're back. We're talking to Nati Laor, who's no stranger to our viewers. Uh, you know him as a philosopher, psychiatrist, expert on trauma and disaster, professor at Yale, press professor at Tel Aviv University, both in philosophy and psychiatry, and a man who knows anthropologically, sociologically, and psychologically what's going on in this country. Nati, we had uh, a few generals on, uh, a couple of soldiers and Knesset members, and uh, we were talking about Boogie Yalom, who was very pessimistic about the future of Israel. We were talking about um, Dichter, who was the head of Shin Bet, who was very optimistic, or nearly optimistic, and the disengagement. Now, before you came on, uh, Yossi Pellet, a very good general in the army, said he's definitely very disappointed in Arak Sharon, because he went to the public saying, I'm going to do X, and he came back doing Y. Psychologically, what does that do to the public? And B, when Yalom says there's in a sense doom, and Dichter says there's hope, what happens to your patients? What what goes on there? The patients, they get the, into trauma. The country is on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we get confused. We get confused. One needs to think for oneself, and uh, not many people can do this. So one loses trust in authority and in experts which is a source of uh, chaos. Now, I think Sharon is using it to, and he succeeded in demolishing the right as well as the left. And he's staring midstream, um, an, an authoritarian leader uh, as he is, uh, to actualize his plan. Now, we were uh, warned by uh, writers, not only by uh, Boogie Alon by Aleph Bet Yoshua, who is a left centrist writer. And he said, we'll go for this plan, and if it won't work, then we have all the right in the world for a global response against the Palestinians. Is this the wonderful view we have ahead of us? <laughs> this is the best of all possible worlds if things do not work out. So what do kids feel? I mean, uh, Abu Vilan was on the show last week. Uh, he's a merits person, good fighter. He says, if we don't live with hope, why, why are we here? I mean, that's what he says. Yeah, but we don't want to have false hope. We see reality. Reality now is that kids exert a lot of violence on each other. We have a wave of violence sweeping across the country. Yeah. Almost daily reports of kids stabbing each other. Jews stabbing Jews. We're not talking about Arabs stabbing Jews or vice versa. It's Jewish kids stabbing Jewish kids. Unheard of. Why any reasoning for that? Nothing? Aggression? A few years ago, we were asked about the uh, possible impact of the Intifada on the Israeli youth. So, it was easy to predict trauma. And we did find uh, between 10 and 40 percent of post-traumatic kids in Tel Aviv as well as on the West Bank. But about violence, uh, one could uh, hesitate to, uh, to predict because it has to do with the capacity of uh, the culture to contain. Now, we've been exposed day in and day out to pictures of violence on TV. And this is like virtual reality, it's like playing Nintendo. Okay. So kids may be uh, influenced by these images and just fall into the movie. 
and they are, uh, they are, I would say, infected with violence. Is the country prepared psychologically for a disengagement? I don't think so. Really? I don't think so. Psychologically, the people who need to be pulled back from the uh, Gaza Strip are not psychologically prepared. The kids there are, are held as hostages in a way. Uh, they are part of the uh, group that are uh, uh, preaching their own uh, uh, ideology and the trauma is going to be severe, that's my prediction mm. for this group when the clashes begin. It won't be a smooth process, it cannot be a smooth process. For example, May 20th, I marked it for myself, the, uh, uh, the the National Religious Party's uh, newspaper, Ratsofe, uh, announced that uh, tens of new, new settlers joined the Gaza Strip against the government's uh, uh, decision. And they published on the newspaper. So it means that uh, there is a steady stream, steady stream of people. Yesterday I heard it on the radio. The thousands are going to go and march down to the Gaza Strip. Among those thousands, there could be uh, uh, right-wing extremists. So you're afraid of a little civil war? I, uh, uh, clashes for sure. I don't think there would be a civil war. No. But there, would, there, would be, there are going to be clashes. There are going to be ugly scenes, tragic scenes, and we are all influenced by uh, these constitutive events. General Khalutz, the new chief of staff, yeah. said uh, this week that uh, he would, he's going to protect soldiers, and if a Jewish, ter uh, a, a Jewish settler fires on a set a uh, Ameri American on an Israeli soldier, yeah. he will be uh, there to respond. He should respond. Right. right. That, what does a statement like that do? Uh, it ups the ante. It's it was unnecessary. To my, to my really? mind, unnecessary. Why say it? Now, ahead of time, when everybody knows that such an event... Maybe they're fearful, the soldiers. Maybe he had to give an order. The soldiers could get orders in time. But now it's inflaming. I think it's inflaming. So you think there could be casualties because it's they have a, a license? It's they a defensive a stance. It's a defensive stance. Why, why preach violence right now? I think it's defensive. Uh, the right wing advertises the disengagement as a racist, a racist transfer. So, uh, the Nazis, the Holocaust, these are the metaphors that are in the air. So who is fighting who? We are all right. Jews. Psychologically, these people believe, is it divinity, is it Torah, is it the Bible, is it the fact that they want to have a greater Israel, is it greed, what is it that compels this uh, strong, uh, I don't know if it's fanaticism or not, but, but that, that these people are in a sense self-righteous against the government, the Supreme Court ruled against them, everybody ruled, every legal possibility is exhausted here, and this society once the law is established, it's established. What pushes these people? Well, we have to uh, remember that they came to, um, to power. They actually were created after 73. Why not after 67? 67 was a spasm of uh, messianism. Right. The Gushim after 73. Right. It was after the disaster of 73, the surprise of 73, when the religious parties, the religious groups, realized that they may, that we, as Jews, may lose this land. Now, the appearance of this land metaphor within the political discourse uh, brought a wave of messianism and uh, confir uh, confirming messianism. Uh, messianic? Messianic. Uh, conf uh, Confirm, it was a confirming instance in the history of religious Zionism, meaning that here we are uh, at the footsteps of the Messiah. Uh, otherwise, that was Rabbi Cook. Rabbi Cook, the the son of the uh, Abraham Cook, 
Rabbi Cook, the, the father, was uh, one of the first religious Zionists, because if you know the history, and we've talked about it many times on the show, uh, the religious uh, people, are, the, most of the religious rabbis in Europe and other places didn't believe in Zionism, they thought it secular. So they were not really, and, and you could not establish yourself until the Messiah came to this land. So until the Messiah came, there's no sense to be here. And then there evolved the religious Zionists, which was Rabbi Cook, who said there's a process and Israel's part of this process and we go forward. And then came his son, who became, uh, I guess, more ultra nationalistic about the land, etc. Is that correct? Ultra fundamentalist. Fundamentalist. Ultra fund fundamentalist about the land. And the fact that we are uh, we are getting our land back was a confirm confirming instance from heaven that uh, the Messiah is here. We just need to push a little bit further. So Gush uh, came to the fore. Now each trauma just strengthened Gush Emunim. So this is a, co a constitutive moment for Gush Emunim. Would it's these people psychologically give their lives for the land at this moment? Would they lay down and do something dramatic like that? Uh, we know that uh, one of the uh, ex-chief rabbis gave them an order to retreat in peace. That was... Eliyahu. He said it just last week. Um, so the rabbis understand that we, at this moment, is periculous, and uh, they fear civil war. They don't want to be condemned, like after Rabin's assassination, this uh, whole group was condemned. Their education and the like. So right. They, they, Anybody who wore a uh, uh, skull cap yeah. was looked upon with disdain. Yeah, right. It was a difficult moment. We were strolling together uh, around the city and we felt it. So uh, I believe that the rabbis, would, uh, the responsible ones, uh, would give an order to uh, retreat. Uh, a big blow up would be prevented, but this would go till the end. And against this background, I understand but Khalud's isn't, comment. But isn't there a uh, conflict between certain rabbis? Certain rabbis, certain rabbis say uh, you, you, you cannot uh, yeah, give up the right, land, and right. any Dying. soldier who brings out is right. condemned to some kind of uh, Torah death, uh, halacha uh, death. Uh, yeah, they, they, they really say you shouldn't, you shouldn't participate in this, you refuse orders. There are some rabbis who Which say Which breaks this. the foundation of the army. That's right, the army. And there are extremists who don't care, not about the army, not about the government, not about the, the, the justice. They may do something. And uh, right now, it's extremely unclear where we're going. Is this one of the pivotal points in Jewish history? Is this akin to the Alatalena? Or this is even stronger because the Alatalena was only a group of a couple of hundred. Alatalena was a ship that was coming in to supply the Yagun, which was uh, a, a separate military force in Israel. And Ben Gurion gave an order to uh, take the arms and cachet that they had. And it was done on no other by Yitzhak Rabin, and it was a historical decision in Israel. Is, is, are we at the same place now? I think we are, and, uh, and the reason is because previous governments in Israel, including Ariel Sharon, who is, uh, I would say, the most responsible person for the current situation, and it's an irony of history that he should be involved on the other side. Maybe there is no other way. He created this, uh, this popular militia. I would say that Gushi Munim on the West Bank is a popular militia. They have rifles, they have ammunition, and they were supplied by the uh, government to them. So they have the capacity to create war. This is why it's such a crucial moment. And uh, nobody's collecting these rifles. Okay, so you're a psychiatrist and uh, you talk to other psychiatrists and people who get confused what happens to them when they get confused? I'll give you an example, Leon. On the West Bank, there was just a study released that on the West Bank, there is, among youth, adolescents, there's twice as much alcoholism than among uh, uh, age-matched youth in the mainland. I see. So people who get confused, youngsters, they get either <coughs> more willing to sacrifice themselves 
or get more drunk and violent. Uh, we know that the youngsters who go to the extreme right, they are the hill youth, the hilltop youth. Uh, they are the most extreme uh, uh, among the Gush Emunim uh, group. So how do you get to these groups? It's, it, I once wrote a book called the, the Confronting the Israeli-Arab Conflict, and at the end of the day I said it all depends on the clerics, whether it's the Muslims, the rabbis, or the priests. Is that where it's at? Is it with the clerics? Could a cleric, could a rabbi, but you don't have a consensus with the rabbis. If you add a, well, and you have chief rabbis in this country, but they're mainly political. They don't, they don't have the influence on these people, do they? The, the chief rabbis, the chief rabbis of the country. Both, we have the, two, Sephardic, so. yeah, they have two, Sephardic and Ashkenazi. They don't have the influence. <coughs> the influence is within the Gush Emunim rabbis, and there are two or three kinds of rabbis there. There are the rabbis who are <coughs> trying to mediate, they are youngsters are trying to mediate between the extreme right and the center. They don't have much power. Uh, a lot of power ha have the rabbis who are on the extreme right, and the youth is uh, following them blindly. Why do they? The well, is there any reason why they got so much power? Because they are coherent. They are fundamentalist. They are. They, it's like they a, give a structure. They, it's a clear structure. And it's coherent and logical, and everything flows smoothly from the first premise. No gray. No gray, it's black and white. And youth are susceptible to such ideologies. They know. They present themselves as, as the ones who know, and the Messiah is in, at the door. A, a person who lives a child on the West Bank, who loses a child, does he have a different reaction than, let's say, a, a child, God forbid, was lost to a parent in Tel Aviv? Do they think it's for a cause, or it's because it's uh, messianic, or the Torah? Do they have a different outlook, totally? So, some of the parents, are all of the par all parents grieve. Right. Uh, the question is, what do you do with grief? Some people turn grief into vengeance. And we see this among uh, Palestinian mothers and sisters who then bomb themselves. Wow. And we had one like that. Uh, and we see this among our own. Um, a father, uh, two days ago, a father who lost his daughter. Uh, she was, uh, I would say, one year old or so. He lost his daughter. He became a, a very right-wing extremist. He's uh, after revenge. So, violence breeds trauma. Trauma and violence breed revenge. And here we have the cycle of uh, uh, of. Uh, now I know you're area. you're very involved in community education and, right. and bringing together communities. But could that work even in the religious settlements? I would say yes. You know, I spent some time on the West Bank with uh, one of the rabbis there, and we were able to analyze a few instances. Uh, we analyzed the violent instances and the religious parties and groups' reactions to these instances according to halacha and the Talmudic uh, references. Halacha is rabbinical law. Uh, not all our audience is Jewish, not, not all of them are even orthodox. So halacha was law that was created by the rabbis based upon uh, the Talmud and the, and the Gemara and, and other Jewish uh, books. So one can introduce a premise of pride and superiority and then tend to humiliate the other. Other premises look for equality and for human dignity and what you always uh, uh, said, uh, the principle or Hillel's principle, uh, love thy neighbor as thyself. So if you stick to that, love thy neighbor as thyself, even if you feel that you own a piece of land, it doesn't come at the expense of another person's well, respect. Well, Hillel's arch opponent was Shammai. So where would he be today on the West Bank? Who Shammai. Would, yeah. <laughs> Shammai was uh, the uh, very, the type, the, the ideal type of a West Bank. Hillel would be studying in the yeshiva. 
and uh, doing, doing chesed, you know, charity, and uh, bringing people close to the to to, to Torah. Um, what people are doing today, what people are doing today, is practically a, a sacrilege. You know, to turn the land into an idol is idolatry. Uh, now we know that that. Uh, if they are ready to sacrifice their kids, this is human sacrifice. This is how I view it. You've heard it. Nati, thanks Thank for you. coming on. It's always a pleasure to have you. Stay tuned. Uh, we'll continue. We'll give you more insights into what's going on in Israel. But uh, you've heard what trauma is going to possibly happen after the disengagement. We'll be right back. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the Diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening, a book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. We're back, and we're talking to uh, someone who's never been on our show before, Dr. Aryeh Eldad, who's a member of the National Union Party, which is a, a right-wing party. I won't call it extreme right-wing or extreme left-wing, but it's a right-wing party. And uh, he's a physician. And we just heard Nati Laor, who is a psychiatrist, and telling us about the condition of the country psychologically. Now we'll talk to Arya about uh, the condition of the country through the eyes of the National Union Party. If I say disengagement to you, what do you say? Disengagement is a catastrophic plan for us and I really think it leads the country to Nati Laor field, more to my field in medicine. I mean, You're we a plastic need, surgeon, you'll yes. be curing people. I'm treating burns. But I really think the country will be in PTSD situation, post-traumatic stress disorder after the disengagement. It won't need plastic surgery, it will need radical... All right, Ari, we, we've done a series of interviews today, and we've had uh, Abu Valan on, who's a member of the Knesset, mm -hmm. and the other side from the Merits. Uh, everybody talks about the demographic problem, and that if you don't make... Uh, peace with the Arabs and have a two-state solution, then demographically uh, Israel will be sort of wiped off the map demographically, it's Jewish state. How do you attack that problem? I think it's kind of a demagoguery because uh, I really believe that even if we will build a fence in the heart of the country, the Arabs won't go away and you can't keep a population that might be the same size of the, the Jewish population in Israel and its income is 17 times lower than the income in the other side of the fence just by building a fence you won't block them and by creating a hostile state that might turn into a terror state on one side of a fence won't keep us away of the demographic question, problem. I really believe that if we just lean on the demographic issue, we might end at the same point, not 20 years from now, but 35 years from now, with the Arabs that are citizens of Israel. So you can't just run away from the problem by building fences and cutting off some parts of the nation in order to keep your majority. Otherwise we will have to give up Galilee when the Arabs will be the majority in the Galilee or in North Negev if they will be the majority there. And eventually we will be strangled in Tel Aviv area because we, we hopefully will still be the majority in Tel Aviv. 
Right. Do you believe in a Palestinian state? Yes, in Jordan. I really believe Jordan is Palestine. I know that 70% of the population of Jordan are Palestinian. I know that the Jewish homeland that were given by the, the, the League of Nations and by the Balfour Declaration in 1917 and then in 1922, Israel was, or Palestine at that time, was both sides of the Jordan River. We were forced to give up three quarters of it to create an Arab state in Jordan. They are 70% of the population. That's why Jordan is already Palestine. But the world doesn't accept that, Daria, right? The world didn't accept Palestinian state as well. The world didn't accept the fact that Jews are entitled to have a, their own independent state until we force the world by fighting for it to accept it. The world tend to accept the easiest solution or what seems to be the easiest solution. Right now, when Israel gives up every time more and more land and ready to accept a Palestinian state, that seems to be the easiest solution. If we will insist that we are entitled to have an independent Jewish homeland stand west to the Jordan River, and no damage will be done if the Arabs that will stay in Israel will vote for a parliament in Amman. They can still live in Ramallah, in Nablus, in Hebron, but they vote to a parliament in Amman. That's the least dangerous situation that I can expect. What do you, what do you say about rabbis who, who tell soldiers, and your former chief surgeon general of the Israeli army, which is me, the top doctor, and some rabbis have come out and said that these soldiers, if they have to evacuate uh, uh, settlers from Gush Katif or someplace, should not do it. Wouldn't that destroy the backbone of the Israeli army? It's extremely dangerous, but it's not only the rabbis. It's the, the IDF moral code that will, was written by Professor Asa Kasher, a left-wing philosopher an expert in ethics in Israel, and he wrote in the ethical code of the IDF, a soldier will not use its weapon or its force against non-combatant civilians. And at the same time, soldiers are sent by the command of the Israeli government to use their force to deportate non-combatant non-fighting right. so citizens. So if a settler has a gun, could a, would, would that be ethical to be able to shoot at him? Chavut said it the other day, that uh, if a settler has uh, fires on a soldier, the soldier should fire on a soldier. Of course. Nobody, nobody really dreams or, or imagines that a, a settler will, will shoot a soldier. It won't happen. We call and we will organize a collection of all firearms from all settlers during the time of the disobedience. So you'll have civil obedience? Yes. Civil disobedience, non-violent. Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Thoreau, okay, the Americans. That's fine in a democracy, and no one can argue with that. Are you very disappointed in Sharon? I mean, he probably was someone ideologically that you might have loved, and your father was a great leader in the Stern group. Uh, and I'm sure that you sh thought Sharon was more in the way you, you thought, and now it's a reversal. We had, we had the warning signs. The, the warning signs were written clear enough on, on, on the wall after Yamit, when he demolished the, the, the town of Yamit in North Sinai. But we really hope that he regret what he was doing in Yamit. We really hope that uh, the new Sharon that we knew that built so many settlements is the right Sharon. It's not a disappointment. It's a feeling of deep betrayal. I think he abandoned hundreds and thousands of people he sent to capture the hills, and now he abandoned them. Why do you think he's done this? We don't have a good explanation except an accumulation of external pressures. 
The first and maybe the most important was the criminal Indeed. investigation against him. The second one was the vacuum that was created by what he was trying to, to lead. He, he hoped that Bush will, will stay with his vision, but the next morning he, he, he woke up with the roadmap, which is a catastrophic plan for Israel. The Geneva uh, plan was threatening to, to be more powerful even than the roadmap. And his advisor told him that there's only one spin, one move, that will get him away of all these troubles, to change direction, to, to get the Americans off his back. He hoped to buy a lot of time with his plan. Right now we know that he won't get even a minute after he will uh, send away all, all the population, evacuate the, the, the area. Condoleezza Rice is here next week to demand what's next. What will be next? His political existence is dependent on the left and the Arab parties. If he will not continue to supply goods, to, to, uh, to uh, evacuate more, more people, more land, he's doomed, he's finished. We will never support him. Do you believe that the disengagement will take place? I really believe we have the power to stop it. Really? I am sure Illegal, that Sharon Illegal. is determined to do it, yes. I'm sure Sharon is determined to do it, but I really believe that there are limits, there are red lines, and if we will be able to, to bring 100,000 people to Gush Katif in North Samaria, he won't be able to evacuate us by force. The Supreme Court, by the way, said that the, the uh, plan was legal. It was challenged in the Supreme Court. I think yesterday or the day before they ruled that it was correct. I know. The Supreme Court in Israel is part of the, uh, the general picture that Israel is a democratic state. We are not. Really? Unfortunately, we are not a democratic state. It's a regime that is run by uh, forces that use non-democratic ways to elongate. To, to, to eternalize their own leadership and, and way of ruling the country. The Supreme Court is, is, uh, is run like that. They elect themselves. We don't have a political influence on the Supreme Court and they are entitled to cancel any law that the Knesset accepts. Aaron Barak, the, the, Chief the Chief Justice, is really so influential that he can elect the next generations of Supreme Judges in Israel. And the way the Knesset is elected is not by a direct constituency, that people elect their own representatives right. in the Knesset and they are accountable, accountable to them. They Members of, of Likud are, are really highly dependent on a corrupt way of election. That's why the ability of mafia forces, of, of uh, really non-democratic ways to, to influence bills, laws, decisions, is extensive. Hmm. How long have you been in the Knesset, uh, are you? Less than three years. Do you enjoy it? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. I mean, when I finished a, a, a day work in the hospital, I knew whether I was doing anything good or bad to my patients. In politics, you never know. You have uh, children of army age, too? Oh, the youngest already is discharged from the army. He, he's on Miluip, he's on reserve. And, and they have the same feelings that you do about Israel and how it's run today, I mean, they're, they're, they're sharing your philosophies? Yes, basically yes. They, each one of them has own, has own uh, nuance. world, nuance, but basically yes. And how, you're a highly intelligent man, how do you view Israel in the next 50 years? What do you see here? We are in a critical crossroad. It's, if, if uh, the disengagement plan will, will take place, 
we are in, in a, a, a very steep slope, very slippery slope. I can't see the next point where we will be able to stop the deterioration. Not only land-wise, geography-wise, but demography and democratically. We are on the wrong way. We really allow a corrupt regime to control our life by the fact that he is conducting a plan that prevents right now the, the media, the, the left-wing uh, uh, opposition, to criticize him. Very important uh, uh, writer in Israel said that the media keeps Sharon like a drug, like a citrus fruit in, in Sukkot, because they want him to fulfill the mission of uprooting the settlers. Otherwise, they know he is so corrupt, they should get rid of him. And the feeling that for one thing, one single mission, the state of Israel is ready to accept corruption, is really threatening our, our bare existence. It is a crucial crossroad. Do you have more faith than Bibi Netanyahu? Bibi Netanyahu is different. He won't be able to do the same plan because I think he is not so powerful as Sharon. I'm afraid that he is not courageous enough to stand right now and take the leadership. He could. He could make the change. But he he refused, or he hesitated. He doesn't have the, maybe the backbone to do it. It's I'm afraid he really prefers Sharon to finish the job, and then he would come as the new healer of the wounds of, of the country, maybe to prevent the next stage. But once this was performed, I mean, the, the uh, uh, precedents of, of uh, Gush Katif and, and the northern part of, of Gaza Strip, going back to the Green Line is, is terrible, internationally, from the international from the, the, the point of view of the international law. Once you accepted that we have to go back to the millimeter, to the green line, there's no way to, to argue about the green line in Judea and Samaria. So I can't see that Netanyahu will be strong enough to, to, to object it, to resist it. This is his chance to do it now. If he won't do it now, he, he won't be a true leader of Israel, ever. Are you personally depressed about everything that's going on here? I'm personally very encouraged from what's going on in the last couple of months. Right after the bill of, of uh, disengagement was accepted by the Knesset, there were two or three weeks of oh, really depression. And then I started to walk. I started to walk from Sano, where I moved. Where is Sano? Sano is North Samaria, one of the settlements that is planned for, for evacuation. And you moved there? Yes. When? Two months ago. You bought a house? I just rented a house. Oh. And I enjoy the fact that the Knesset is paying for it. This <laughs> is my Knesset parliamentary office. But I start walking from Sano, North Samaria, to Gush Katif. It took me two weeks, and I crossed. You walked? Oh yes, within two weeks. Where did you and sleep? more and more, each time in another settlement on the road. Uh -huh. And I talk to the people every evening in the settlement. And every day more people joined it. And we end up in a huge uh, conference in Gush Katif in, in Passover. There where I, I was standing on, on the stage and I hear the people reacting to me, and I called for civil disobedience, and I saw the reaction. And since then, I really can touch and feel the reaction of the people. So and you're invigorated, no, you're invigorated. I don't know. I, there were so many people really? doing it, but I, I really felt that there is a change in the country. And I really believe that we can stop the plan. How many members in uh, your party? We are seven in the Knesset. Seven. And Efi Eitam and Rav Yitzhak Levi will join. There's a whole reshuffle in, in the right wing before the, the election. That 
are going to be soon. Do you think there'll be new elections quickly? Ruby Rivers there's no other, that way. Yes, there's no other way. I hope it will be before the disengagement. But, I th Arya, in the end of the day, either you'll have a Barack or you'll have a, uh, a Sharon. Do you think you'll get somebody from the right wing to become a prime minister? Yes, I think uh, not from, from our party, not in the next 10 years or so, but uh, uh, I really hope that uh, we will be much stronger in the next election. So the only way to, to create a party with, with the Likud that is still going to be the largest yeah. party, I think so, will be with us. So I hope we will be able to influence the policy of the Prime Minister, if not to be the Prime Minister. Do you, have a, you think that Sharon could win again? Never. Really? Never. And do you think anybody from Labour could win? No. So who's left? I'm not running. The, I'm leader, the leader of Likud, whoever will be elected by the Likud in the next... Do they the have any election. prominent type of people? They have, they have uh, Netanyahu, they have Silvan Shalom, they have uh, Mofaz. I, I don't go into into their politics. They have <laughs> many people who, who want to be. I can't see a true leader, but that makes maybe things easier for us to, to influence. But you him. seem to be a leader. Not you yet. walk from one town to uh, that's that's oh. leadership. But it's it's walking. It's not it's not leadership yet. And uh, I I really one mustn't say it. I really enjoyed it. I mean, it wasn't for fun, but. It was a great experience. Great having you on the show, and uh, good luck in your cause, and we'll see where it winds up. We'll follow you. You're an interesting man, and uh, you're a believer in, 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 in your own ideology. So is uh, Rivlin, your Knesset speaker. Yes. And uh, this is the confrontation of Israel today. Uh, we talked to Abu Shalom, a good man, fought in the armies, uh, as uh, Arye did, and no one can predict where this thing is going to wind up. We'll follow this show, I guess. Uh, we won't be out of uh, business because this thing will go on for quite a long time. We'll see you next week.